Javier Millet has taken over as president of Argentina and has begun what he calls shock therapy. What is on his agenda? A fundraising scandal has rocked Japan and a cabinet reshuffle is set to take place. How is the 500 million yen case affecting the government? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Argentina's new president Javier Millet has delivered on his promises a drastic set of measures that will cut spending and is most likely to cause suffering to the poor and working class has been introduced. Now the new president and his ministers say that it is painful but necessary but the real issue is a particular far right wing approach to economic aspects which has failed time and again. We go to Zoe Alexander to understand what these measures are and what impact they'll have on the people. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. So what's been happening since uh, Millet took over a raft of proposals being announced? Well, finally, the perhaps unexpected for many did take place this Sunday. On December 10th, Javier Millet from the Liberty Advances Party was sworn in as president of Argentina, a move many thought they would not see occur. But as we know, he did win by a 10-point difference in the second round of the presidential elections uh, back in November. So... Uh, he had made a lot of what some might call crazy promises when he was um, campaigning for president. Um, Javier Millet is, again, a far-right libertarian. Uh, some of his key promises uh, in the area, of, for example, of the economy, which was one of the areas that he was most um, emphatic about, uh, was saying that he would dollarize the economy, close the central bank, um, and enact harsh austerity measures. So in this first three days, in this first couple of days of Javier Millet's um, presidency, we saw the economy minister, Luis Caputo, one of the few remaining ministers under uh, Javier Millet, make a televised address and announce um, a series of measures to deal with the economic crisis facing Argentina. And there are about 10 of these, and all of them essentially involve cutting public spending um, and um, an approach of kind of making it worse before anything will get better. So uh, amongst the measures that uh, were announced by Caputo um, are that, for example, um, work contracts of state employees that have been working for less than a year are not renewed. Um, all public works of the government, so bridges, uh, public infrastructure um, projects are not renewed and they're suspended. Um, the number of ministries is reduced uh, from 18 to 9 and the government secretaries from 106 to 54. Um, the amount of money transferred from the central government to the regions, the provinces is reduced. Um, there is a reduction of subsidies uh, for energy and transportation. Um, and importantly, the exchange rate of the peso to the dollar is fixed at 800 pesos to the dollar. So there are a couple other of um, economic measures that were announced, but I think what's important to highlight is that in Javier Millet's campaign, the main message was that we're going after the political caste, we're going after the corrupt, we're going after the rich, we're going to, uh, you know, really um, hit them where it hurts, we're going to um, make Argentina for the, the, the people, the hard workers. And what's interesting about all of these measures is that it actually does kind of the opposite of that. These are all measures that will directly impact working people, um, people who are not uh, long-term involved in the government who are not from this this kind of made-up idea of this political caste, as uh, Javier Millet calls it. Um, these are the people who are already most vulnerable. Um, it's going to impact state employees, people, some of the only people, working class people who have stable jobs and salaries. I um, mean, of course, the reduction of subsidies for energy and transportation is brutal because uh, this is this is the daily needs of everyone 
in Argentina. This is uh, means that transportation, taking the bus, taking the subway can be affordable. Um, the price in Argentina is extremely, extremely, extremely affordable and economic because the state subsidizes this transportation. Taking this away, again, it's trying to cut state spending, um, trying to reduce the foreign external debt, et cetera, pay off this debt, um, have less state spending, but this is absolutely going to hurt working people and it in no way actually comes close to touching those who are established economic power, those who establish political power. And could you also elaborate a bit more on how these proposals will affect the common people and what has been the kind of response uh, from working class sections from those who are going to be affected? Well, I sort of mentioned it before, the, the impact on working people of these of these measures. Um, it has been received uh, with a lot of trepidation. I think a lot of people were waiting to see exactly what uh, Millet would really move forward with. Again, as I mentioned before, and we've talked about in other episodes, he has such a radical um, and anti-people proposal. He promised during his campaign harsh austerity. Um, he promised many, many things. And I think that what we're seeing is that he is going to follow through on this harsh austerity. Um, some people call him a, Mac a Macri 2.0, but obviously with a completely different presentation. But it's interesting to note that Macri is deeply involved in his government and helped um, convince major sectors of the right, or and some people would consider center right, to actually get behind Millet. He's been helping a lot of the ministers are those who are close to uh, Mauricio Macri. And so I think that in that perspective, we can see this as a continuation of this very, very intense neoliberal um, policies, which again saw a devastation uh, for the Argentine working people um, pushed into poverty. Uh, the poverty rate today in Argentina is 40% of the population living below the poverty line. Um, this jump from uh, what it was before um, occurred under Mauricio Macri. Uh, it maintained throughout the government of Alberto Fernandez. And I think that it's likely that we'll see this increase during um, Mauricio, uh, during, sorry, uh, Javier Millet's uh, presidency. Um, many of the few middle class, working class people who had not fallen below the poverty line are likely to now, because, for example, uh, those who work with uh, different state programs, state governments, um, and different sort of public projects are all going to be impacted by these cuts. When it when it when they says cutting ministries, cutting secretaries, that means the salaries and the jobs of all of those uh, you know thousands of people who and hundreds of people who are employed there. When there's less money from uh, the federal government going to the provinces, that means provinces will also have to reduce their spending, which again is largely um, hiring people for these social programs that many of them have. Um, this is really going to push people uh, further towards the edge, further into economic precarity. And we've seen that all of the major trade unions in Argentina have already announced their opposition to these measures. Um, I think we're going to see, just as we're seeing maybe what will be a Macri 2.0 in terms of the neoliberal policies, I think we're also going to see that in terms of resistance. Um, the years under Mauricio Macri saw a tremendous level of mobilization by the trade unions, by mass organizations, uh, by workers of the popular economy. And I think that is definitely going to reactivate uh, during these times. Organizations have pledged that they're not going to be afraid. They're not going to be scared uh, by such a, uh, by policies which hit them directly by this discourse of hatred. We know that Javier Millet also has called um, communists left-wing people, people in, uh, who fight for social justice, saying all sorts of things that they're terrorists, that they, or they're criminals, that they're all this, that, the other thing. There have been, you know, not only these economic policies, but really direct threats um, to them. However, organizations said they will not be intimidated um, and they will continue fighting. And especially at this time where it's most important to keep organizing and fighting for the most vulnerable, the most economically uh, precarious, the workers of this popular economy, uh, and so many different other sectors in Argentine society, which will be directly impacted again by uh, what could be hyperinflation, already this established 
currency devaluation, uh, and so many other measures which really hit the pockets of the Argentine people. Thank you so much, Zoe, for talking to us. We'll come back as Millet will definitely be coming up with more such proposals. A fundraising scandal has exposed deep divisions within Japan's ruling Conservative Liberal Democratic Party, or the LDP. In a third cabinet reshuffle to be put in place by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, heavyweights of the LDP's most powerful clique are expected to be dropped as ministers. Nevertheless, while the internal blame game over the scandal of missing 500 million yen continues, the party is facing the worst in anti-incumbency in more than a decade as their popularity has gone below 20%. Anish has more details. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. A 500 million yen scam. So what is this fundraising scandal all about? Yes, Prashant. So the fundraising scandal, in short, is basically how uh, LDP leadership, especially those who belong to the former uh, Abe faction, which is uh, usually called the Abe faction, have used uh, fundraising tickets and you know unaccounted for fundraising money uh, and distributed it among themselves. So what happens is in the in the Japanese uh, electoral system, you can't really fundraise as individual politicians. It has to be through party fundraisers, and the party can actually distribute. Uh, money among uh, their members. Now, what happens here is that, uh, like a s s particular faction, especially, is being targeted as, as being, uh, you know, not targeted, but uh, squared off as the ones to be blamed. And they have used fundraising tickets and, like, unaccounted for money to actually uh, secure largest uh, portion of the funds to themselves. Now, uh, in the larger political context, uh, if you look at the amount of money, 500 million yen uh, is not that much. It translates to about $3.7 million. It's not that much of a huge money, but it clearly shows that there are loopholes and there are possibilities of politicians exploiting the existing system. On the other hand, if you look at the LDP's inner politics, it pr pretty much opens up uh, the, the nature of the kind of factionalism that exists within the party. LDP has always been a party of factions. It was never really that unified as a political faction. It just brought in different factions from ranging from the far right to uh, you know the conservative liberals. And it is pretty much the uh, convergence of these factions that they run. Uh, the current, uh, the most powerful uh, faction obviously is the Sevakai faction, which pretty much was led by Abe before, and it was known for uh, the one that actually led LDP to push the boundaries of the pacifist constitution in Japan, and also pushed for the most, uh, you know, most fundamentalist kind of uh, neoliberal market uh, ideology uh, into the state uh, policies. And it is this faction that is currently being held accountable for, and it is pretty much all the ministers, four ministers that are being, uh, uh, you know, that have been removed uh, from the cabinet reshuffle. Are the, they are the ones who are, you know, the heavyweights, pretty much the collective leadership of this entire faction. And so they are the ones who are right now being held. But it actually exposes problems within other factions as well right now. Right, Anish, so what does this mean for the Kishida government, which is also facing anti-incumbency? Uh, you know, how is he sort of dealing with it? Obviously, it's a developing story. By the time this episode goes out, more ministers might have quit as well, sir. Yeah, so it was already understood that this uh, scandal is going to hit the party at large. Uh, the manner in which uh, we have already seen opinion polls uh, polling at less than 20%, uh, some going as low as 17%, which is possibly the lowest in decades, but definitely the lowest since the LDP came back to power in 2012 after a small uh, three-year interregnum. And in this period, this is probably their worst. And if there is an election uh, very shortly, the LDP will not really survive. Uh, and that has, uh, it clearly shows how people have, uh, you know, grown tired of the current Kishida government. It has been quite mealy mouthed on a whole lot of issues. It has not clearly shown that uh, level of leadership. But most importantly, it has been riddled with one controversy after the other. Despite their recent victories in election in different elections, uh, it has been pretty much ridden with multiple controversies, uh, beginning with the Unification Church uh, controversy that, again, the same faction was, uh, you know, involved in to the current uh, set of faction. And obviously the, you know, absolutely terrible mismanagement of the economy, of, uh, you know, the cost of living crisis, the growing unemployment crisis, the growing suicide crisis even, uh, which is making a comeback in Japan right now. 
and all of these are you know continue to be uh, uh, continue to be unaddressed by the current government and this is pretty much the final nail in their coffin in many ways and that is how everybody looks at it because there is literally there is going to be there they will take a lot more uh, to just uh, you know replacing uh, it with be better ministers in the cabinet for the government to shore up any kind of support at this point because even you know the more conservative core constituencies are actually uh, feeling uh, that uh, feeling disillusioned uh, by the current government. So this is the most difficult part. But what ha might happen is that this government might double down on their militarism, might double down on their, you know, ultra-nationalist policies. And that is going to be bad for the geopolitics of the region as well. Because obviously it's already on the path of militarizing itself in, over the next five years. Uh, the current set of crises are going to make it, uh, you know, go even harder on the, many of these promises uh, and per perhaps that, that is not going to be good for both you know the politics domestically and the politics abroad. Right. Anish thank you so much for explaining that to us. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org, follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on YouTube please hit that subscribe button.